We know already pretty much about crystals, but you have to remember that these are not the only form of solids. Solids generally are divided into crystals and amorphous solid. This is a difficult, difficult word, but generally the word morpho in Greek means form, form. So something what is amorphous is without form. So it doesn't have an in, internal form amorphous solid. Uh, yeah, you probably don't meet this word very often, but I mean it's not very difficult to remember when you know that morph morphem morphem means a structure or form. So solids without structure. And well, here example would be for example NaCl and here the example would be for example glass, this glass. Which gives us of course next question, what does it mean amorphous solid? Is it really solid or is it just liquid? Because we said that the difference between liquids and solid is the order. In liquids you have just very n short range order. In solids this order is much longer. But turns out that the glass is somewhere between. The order is pretty short range rather. It has the property of liquids. And you probably know I mentioned already to you if you take a very very old glass that's how it looks like from this perspective. After let's say 500 or 1000 years, the shape of this one starts looking like that. So it flows down with the gravitation force. Mm -hmm. So such amorphous solids are somewhere between the real solids, which are crystals and glasses. You may consider this as a liquid being cooled down too fast to get the structure. So maybe in many thousand years it will crystallize, but it's taking really long, long, long time. Okay. Now, with the crystals, generally people divide them into four groups. This would be metals, this would be ionic crystals, well I just keep it in metallic crystals, ionic crystals, molecular crystals and so-called network crystals. However, I prefer the work covalent crystals. Let's have an example of each of them. 
metallic crystals not to look far any metal would be generally a metallic crystal mm. oh. for example iron table this part Ionic crystals, for example, NaCl. Molecular crystal, well, not to look for sugar. Or maybe ice. And for the network crystals, mm, sand on the beach or diamond Now, it's kind of easy to distinguish these two because here you have metallic bonds. Here you have ionic bonds. It's also easy to define this one because here you just have covalent bonds. Well, probably I don't have to convince anybody that the remaining category will have all possible other types of bonds. Uh, yes, yeah, sure. Metallic, you write with double L. Sorry for my mistake. So here you have Van der Waals bonds. You have hydrogen bonds. You have donor acceptor bonds. This classification is also telling you which crystals are the weakest or the softest. And definitely this one, having very weak type of bonds inside the crystal structure are the easiest to be broken. Hardest, probably this one, network crystals. When the bond between two neighboring atoms is very strong, for example, like in diamond, you get one of the toughest structure in the world. Good. Uh, there is a lot of different properties of all of them. I guess you will read in your book more detailed. I'm not going to discuss it too detailed. It's just topic for reading rather than for teaching in the class. But let's discuss some other things. What we discuss? Ah, yes. Now we want to 
discuss metal clusters. Uh, metal clusters, so it's metal solids. And for metallic solids, the most popular crystals is the CCP structure and the HCP structure. So cubic close packing and H uh, hexagonal close packing. So the hexagonal primitive or it's a cubic face center cell. These are by no means the most popular structures of crystals made of metal atoms. Next one that is relatively popular would be the cubic primitive. And the last one that is also pretty popular would be the cubic body centered. And for example, give you examples. Uh, for this one, for example, polonium. With the PO, this metal has this structure. For the body center, sodium. For this one, for the face center, platinum. For the hexagonal, I hope I have some example. Not really. Well, I check what is hexagonal later and tell you example of this. Well, probably these four cover like 98% of all possible metals. There are some exceptions, like for example, if I remember manganese, manganese has a very crazy unit cell with 56 atoms inside. That's, that's an example that is very strange. <clears throat> yeah, okay. So this for metallic solids. Now, in the metallic solids, the most popular one is this. So let's discuss for a moment what can happen in these metallic solids. of this structure. Okay. Now you have atoms on every corner, of course, like always. and you have atoms in the middle of every wall. One here. One here. One here. One here. And one One, two, three, four, five. One is missing. This one is missing. To make it larger to show it's here. Okay. Now, I want to show you that these are atoms, but between the atoms you have empty spaces. So let's try to draw these empty spaces. First type of empty space is so-called tetragonal hole. And now I will, well, what, when I mean tetragonal,
I'm in a structure like that. Okay? So somebody can draw in other way by doing just this. This is the different perspective of the same. So now I'm finding this type of hole. Uh, yes, no. At beginning. Okay, I'm connecting these two atoms and these two atoms. Not very visible, but you see that this structure is there. So these four atoms that make a empty space of this shape between them. There are many of them, as you can see. I can write another one, for example, here. One, two, three, four. One, two. One, two. So there is one here, one there, one there. There are really many of them inside these crystals. The spaces between four atoms like that. Okay, now I'm, this is called tetragonal hole. And this tetragonal, uh, why tetra? Tetra means because there are four faces here, or four, four centers. And this is very small. Good. There is another one, another type of hole in this same crystal. So let me first write it. Difficult part. <coughs> Two. Four. Six. Good. Now I'm writing something what is called octagonal hole. So octagonal, this was tetragonal. Octagonal looks like that. And probably it's not very difficult to notice where it is. So you may say it's in the center.
And this is rather big. Good. So what we know is that this structure is filled in 74% and it's empty in 26%. Now I'm showing that this empty space consists of this type of holes and at the same time the empty space consists of these types of holes. Now if these places are empty something can enter there. These holes only something what is very small can enter. This hole something what is larger can enter. So now we will discuss ionic solids. Well, I show you the examples which metals crystallize in which structures when we have the uh, PowerPoint class. Okay, then I will show you all the periodic table of elements and showing which metal crystallizes in which structures. So that, that would be also the example of the hexagonal metal. Now we discuss the ionic solids. And we have What is larger, anion or cation? Usually, anion. Anion is larger. So we have a cubic F network for anions. And to be consistent with this picture, I should use orange here. And now I can have two possible type of structures. Tetragonal holes fields. Or the other structure would be the octagonal holes. Well, I'm, I'm probably mistaken. It should be octagonal. They are called octahedral. And these are called tetrahedral. Again, it, it's a problem with, with, the, with the meaning. Tetragonal means four points. Tetrahedral means four walls. In this case, this is really octahedral. There are eight walls here. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. But that would be hexagonal. So eight corners, six corners. So octahedral. So we are changing our... Writing to tetrahedral and octahedral holes field. And now we know that in this case we have small cations because the holes are small and in this case we have larger cations what happens when the anions and cations have similar size well then we don't have cubic F anymore but we have cubic P network for anions.
why we have cubic P network for anions. Ah, it's easy to understand when you draw it. So we again start with the unit cell. We put the anions in the places. And now you see that the hole that we are writing here with blue or with red, now the hole looks like that. It's all the crystal, all the cell. It's the hole. And the other atom can come inside. This hole is really big. So this is the largest empty space. Which is also consistent with the fact that this structure has very large empty space. Not 26%, but if I remember correctly, something like 38% of empty. Is it correct, 38? What was the filling of the cubic P? We calculated in the last class and measured. Somebody has this data? Forty-eight? Forty-eight is empty, right? Okay. So these are large cubic holes. These three are the most popular ionic structures. This one, for example, <coughs> with the large cubic holes is cesium chloride. chloride. Again, cesium chloride is one of the structures having exactly that structure when the anions are on the corners and the cations are in the middle. But there are many others, but usually people use this name for saying this solid has the cesium chloride structure. What about these octahedral hole spills, this one in the middle? Well, turns out that this is the structure of NaCl. And people usually call this structure as a rock salt structure. Not with this one. This one is, for example, the structure between zinc and sulfur. And usually this structure is called zinc blend structure. But somebody may tell me, oh, this is strange. Because let's calculate the number of cations and anions in every crystal. In this one, for the anions, number of anions, you have eight of them, but each of them is only in one eight inside. 
So totally there is only one anion here. For the number of cations, it's simple. It's only one in the middle. So you see one, one ratio of anions to cations. It's correct. This is exactly like cesium chloride formula says. Let's calculate this one. That would be a bit more difficult because we have to identify all octahedrals in this one. Well, to do this we probably need some more space. And you see that one of them is inside, in the middle. Now when you draw the next cell on this side, there would be another one in the middle. But you see that these two will also make a space for something that would be above. Mm. Okay. Let's try to do this. And we, we, it's easy to find the one of them. But now we should look for the another one of them. So another one of them, I'm going to use the blue chalk for it. Another one of them will come here. Now, there is also this, okay, this line is the same like, like this. These two are the same like this and this. These two are the same like this and this. What about that two? They are sticking out to the next cell. Okay. So the question is, how much of the blue structure is inside this cell? You probably see that between this wall and that wall, the degree is 90 degrees. The angle is 90 degrees. So it means there is one fourth of the hole inside this unit cell. Similar story is on the other side. One fourth. Similar stories on this side. And similar stories on the other side. One, two, three. But now it will be very difficult to see anything here more. 
but anyway, this is one fourth and one fourth. How much space we already filled? Taken, 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 and now this part will be taken by the tetragonal holes. Four of them. So you see that this is one tetragonal holes, another one will be there. Between these two tetragonal holes, there will be empty space not taken by anything. But in fact, there will be another, another uh, octagonal holes around here in this area. How much of it? Turns out that this is only the upper part. So we only have this part of the tetragonal hole there, the upper part, which is one, one eighth. Let me think once again. One, two, no, it's one fourth also. So we have, yeah, yeah, that's another way of thinking about that. You can think that each line like that has one fourth of the whole. So this line, this line, this line, this line. But we also have this, 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 and this. OK, that's a good way of counting this. So for the octagonal holes, one of them is in the center, and we know. And now we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 12 times 1 fourth. Because every line like that is inside some tetragonal, octagonal holes. So that would be 1 plus 3 is 4. So the number of octagonal holes is 4. Good. We are ready to calculate how many anions and how many cations. Number of anions is each of them in the corner, eight times of them, is one eight inside, plus there is six of them of the wall, and each of them is half, which is three anions, uh, four. Four anions. Number of cations is the number of these holes. Is, as we calculated, is one plus 12 times one four also four. So the number of cations and number of anions is again the same, which justifies the structure NaCl. I know that not counting them is not easy, but if you do it at yourself at home or best, build the model out of some something, then it will be easier to see. Good. Now we are going to calculate the number of tetrahedral holes. Okay. And you see that these two atoms contribute to one hole. These two contribute to one. One, one. Or maybe in other words, every atom here in the middle contributes to four holes. You probably can see it in all four directions. So now I'm calculating the number of tetrahedral holes. And it would be every atom in the middle, and there are six of them, contributes to four holes, four holes. And that would be a mistake because you see that, for example, this hole is made by three corner atoms. So we calculate the number of them three times. We have to divide it by three. And probably this is not a good way of counting. 
I mean, this gets the same result, but it's, it's not clear. Let's consider these atoms. These atoms are better. This atom contributes only to one tetragonal hole, to this one. This atom contributes to one hole there. Each of them in the corner contributes to one of them. So the number of tetragonal holes is eight. Okay. Now, each of them has some cation inside. So we can calculate the number of anions is eight times one eight is one. Number of cations and you see uh, 818 eight plus, of course, 6 times 1 half, which is 4. Yes. Number of cations, you see that it would be equal to the number of tetrahedral holes. So it's equal to 8. We got a problem. Here is 4, here is 8. It doesn't correspond to this ratio. Maybe if you put 2 here, that would be correct. What is wrong? Turns out that nothing is wrong. Turns out that just only half of the holes are filled. The other are empty. Now we should understand when two ions, cation and anion, are choosing which network. This is usually understood by calculating something what is called ionic ratio. I call it by rho. And that would be defined as the radius of the cation divided by the radius of the anion. Easy to calculate from the data, atomic data or ionic data. And now, when this raw is smaller than 0 0.4, which means that cations are very, very small and anions are rather large, then we have the small holes field. So then we have the zinc blend type. If this raw is larger than 0 0.4 but smaller than 0 0.7, then we have the larger holes, the octahedral holes field, and we have the NaCl type. Finally, in the extreme case, when this row is larger than 0 0.7, we have the cesium chloride type of ionic crystal. Now, it would be really nice if it's always like that, but it's not always like that. Or maybe very often it's not like that. This is maybe good for 70% of cases. The other one are not following this simple chemistry.
Good, good time for break. 10 minutes break. Let's continue. Um, what we discussed just like now about the holes, it's true not only for ions and ionic solids, but also for metallic solids. Mm. Ah, yeah, but before we go there, I just wanted to discuss with you how the solids really look like. So, let's take NaCl first. Maybe a good question. This is not nothing to do with chemistry, but just for logical thinking. This is a three-dimensional cube. This one is a two-dimensional cube. What I'm asking now is a four-dimensional cube. How this one looks like? Anybody can draw? Somebody can say, no, it's impossible because the degree must be 90 degrees between the cube. But I answer that here, it's not 90 degrees. It doesn't look 90. Because we are trying to put three-dimensional object in the two-dimensional space. So now I'm asking you to take the four-dimensional object and put on the two-dimensional space how this one looks like. Anybody wants to try? I mean, this, again, this is completely useless. You never use it in your life. But I think it's interesting to open your perspective a bit. OK, I try to draw. Let's start from the one-dimensional cube. One-dimensional cube looks simple. Looks like that. OK? Now, two-dimensional cube, you take this cube. OK, I put it in red. Okay. You take this cube, you put it here, and then you drag it in the other dimension down and make a copy of it. And after you make the copy, you just connect. So that was the transition from the one dimension to two dimensions. Now, from two dimensions to three dimensions, You just take a two-dimensional cube and make a copy of it in the third dimension. And this is the copy. And then you just connect. So this gives you an idea how to make a four-dimensional cube. First, draw a three-dimensional cube. and make a copy of this in the fourth dimension, wherever it is, here, 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 you can choose any direction. Let's say I'm choosing this direction. Okay. So I'm, this point goes here. So if this point goes there, That's the copy, right? And now I'm connecting. One, two, three, 
four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, doesn't look very good. But this is the four dimensional cube written on the two dimensional plane. You can go to the fifth dimensional later by making a copy of this in the other dimension and connecting, but you will not see anything. Yeah. You see that one dimensional cube has two ends because this is the two to the power one. Two dimensional cube has four ends. This one has eight ends. This one has 16 ends. Well, if you look at this a bit longer, you see that the cubes that you have here, you can find also in some strange places. You see that this one, one, this is also a cube. You can also find another cube, of course, here, another cube also here, just a bit distorted. There are many cubes inside. I suggest drawing it as an exercise at home. Okay. Finish the digression. Let's come back to our structure. NaCl. We put the Na atoms as blue and we put the Cl atoms orange. So we start with anions and we have them. And now I put cations. Inside every octahedral hole is one. One is in the middle. And now for every octahedral hole, I'm writing one. So one here, one here, one here, one here. You see that this, in fact, makes a very nice structure. be much nicer if my drawing is nicer. And you see it's very regular. Thank you. Good. It's very regular and nice. And also it shows that it doesn't matter if you choose anions or cations as a starting point. Because you see that if I draw this a bit farther, for example, this direction, that there are cations And these cations make also a cubic F structures. It's just shifted with respect to the anion cubic F structures. So this is explaining how one Brave type can be used to construct such more complicated structures. Just two cubic, two cubic F unit cells are overlapping with the shifting of half period of the cell down or this direction or this direction. Okay. Good. So we know how the NaCl structure looks like. 
it's pretty easy to, to draw the structure of the large uh, cubic holes. So CA, C, uh, cesium, CL. And again, chlorine and cesium. So we start with the chlorine. We know it's a cubic P. And we know that inside there is one big cesium, everything. Now, if you think about that longer, you see that you can make a copy of the unit cell here. And you can make a copy of the unit cell here. And in the copies of the unit cell, the blue atoms will be always in the middle. And if you make another copy in front, you get that the cation atoms, they also have the cubic P network. But again, in this case, in this case, the cubic F network was shifted down. In this case, it's shifted on the diagonal from here to here on this line. So again, you have the simple Brave type of cubic P repeated with the shifting for anions. And finally, we draw the last structures, which is the tetragonal hole. This is the most difficult one to draw. But still, we don't give up. We just try. So that would be the thing S. So again, we start with putting anions in the place. And the anions would be, of course, the sulfur atoms. And later, we put the zinc atoms in a place. OK, this is the first trial. Then. Oh. Unfortunately, I didn't draw a good one. They are overlapping. We will not see anything. OK, I try once again. Probably a bit better. Okay, and now we said that every second tetragonal hole is filled. Let's construct every second tetragonal hole. One. Two. I use blue for this one. For the other two, I use yellow.
is correct uh, what can I do and one more left that would be here You don't see anything, but it's, it was a difficult job anyway. So I put atom in the middle of every of them. One, <laughs> two, <coughs> three, and four. Yeah, that's it. That's finished. You have to draw it at home. Otherwise, you never see it. But there is a picture in your book. There would be the figure 538. In the old book, page 181, it's 538. Uh, no, it's not 538. It's 543. It? Yeah, which is kind of showing how this is done. Yeah, I know it's difficult to believe this is the same, but it is. Good. And uh, well, it's also very difficult to show that the blue atoms also make the cubic F network, but they do. In fact, they do. Okay, let's continue. After having these structures written, We move for a moment again to metals. And generally metals are divided into two categories. One of them are just metals made of one element only. And other one are the metals made of two or more than two different elements. These are called alloys. Now, these alloys can be divided into two different parts, two different types of alloys. One are called substitutional. And the other were called interstitial. I know these are terrible names, but turns out that it's not so terrible if you try to understand that the name for the whole is interstice. Inter means between, and styles means something. I don't know what styles means. But it means between atoms, I guess. So 
So hole, another name for holes are interstices. And we have the interstitial alloys and we have the substitutional alloys. How to understand what they are? It's very easy to understand when you draw uh, some unit cell. And if this metal would be pure, the unit cell would look like that. But since the metal is not pure, it has two types of atoms, then some part of them are replaced by the other atoms. usually in the disorder way. What is the condition for this? The condition is that radius of atom 1 must be similar to the radius of atom 2. If these atoms are of similar size, they can make substitutional alloys. Ah, okay. This is very easy to understand because what does it mean interstitial? When the atoms have different size, then the larger one hmm, I didn't try that way so we have atom one which is larger so the atom one makes a network, for example, cubic P, and inside the network, somewhere here, is atom two. And again, it is the similar story like we discussed a moment ago. In the substitutional, generally everything holds what we discussed for single unit cells, but now just on the corner of the unit cells there can be different atoms. So there is some disorder in alloys. In the case of this one, the situation from ionic solids holds. You can have the cubic holes, big ones, you can have the octahedral holes, smaller, or the tetrahedral, even smaller. And depending on the size between atom 1 and atom 2, atom 2 is the small one, you can have different type of alloys with different structure. Well, looks like we finished solids. So now we go for a moment to liquid crystals. Liquid crystal is something between solids and crystals. Uh, solids and liquids. Somebody can ask, does it make sense? How can be something what has, is between the long range order and short range order? Does it mean medium range order? No, I say no. It doesn't mean medium range order. Something else. In solid, 
we have a three-dimensional long range order. In liquids, we have three-dimensional short range order. In liquid crystals, we have one dimensional long range order and a two dimensional short range order. What does this mean? Imagine the situation when your molecule is very long and very thin, like that. And you put next molecule to it. OK, another story here is that it can be two-dimensional long and one-dimensional short either. Anyway, between these two. Imagine a molecule that looks like that. Now, when you put the next molecule to it, there is a big chance that the molecule will put itself like that. And the next one may be like that. And the next one somewhere here, somewhere here. But none of the molecules will go like that. Because if the molecule goes like that, there will be a lot of empty spaces. And molecules like to be close because when they are close, they can interact. So this is wrong one. But these are nicely ordered. So you see that long molecules have an order that is somewhere between a solid and a liquid. Another one. Another type of the molecule will be very flat, flat and round molecule like that. Then the another one will get like that, but none of them will go like that because that would make a lot of empty space, not good for interactions. So there would be an order in this direction in this case, but total disorder in this direction because they don't interact with each other. Similarly here. There would be order in this direction and in this direction, but there would be disorder in this direction. And these two types of substances, they make something which is between solids and liquids. How it happens? Usually when the solid, when these structures are in solid, in all three dimensions there is order. But when they start melting, they start melting in one dimension faster than in the other dimensions. Imagine this situation when you have a beautiful structures of these things in a crystal. And the temperature goes up. When the temperature goes up, they start vibrating, sliding a bit, and finally there is a phase transition, and these two are not anymore held together. There is still not enough energy that the molecule turns like that, because it's squeezed between two, but this molecule can slide this direction and this direction, but it cannot rotate, not enough energy. So there is a temperature when these molecules can kind of slide on each other, making this type of movements. But they cannot make movement in this direction. And that's exactly the liquid crystal. So that's a way of obtaining liquid crystals. You have a solid and you kind of melt it. But you melt it in only one or two dimensions, not in three dimensions. So it depends on the temperature very much. This type of uh, liquid crystals, there are melting, they are called thermotropic.
thermotropic liquid crystals. It means that the temperature can change them from solids to liquid crystals and later to real liquid. There is also another type of liquid crystals and these are more complicated things. For example, imagine a molecule, long one, that has two ends. One of the ends likes water, the other end doesn't like water. Okay, so here we have the hydrophilic and we have the hydrophobic. Well, hydro means water, phobic, there is a name of the, it means afraid in Latin. So the claustrophobic means somebody who is afraid of closed rooms. What it? Aragophobic means somebody who is afraid of spiders. And there are names for all of these Latin names. And philic means somebody who likes something. So there is a molecule that has long structure. One side of the molecule likes water, uh, doesn't like water. The other part likes water. What can be the example? Imagine a very long alcohol. CH3, CH2, CH2, long, 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 CH2, OH. Now, this part doesn't have any hydrogen bonds to water, but this part can make a hydrogen bond to water. So this is an example of such a molecules that having the hydrophilic and hydrophobic uh, ends. Now what happens when you add these molecules to water? Well, then all of these molecules will go to the surface of the water with one end sticking on the water and the other end sticking out. So the situation will look like that. When the water would be around here. So these molecules will make a layer. Another way, the molecules, when they cannot go to the surface, when there is too many of them, they will try to cluster like that. When here is the water outside, and inside there is no water, or there is even something else. Turns out that these things are also called liquid crystals. And the reason is that they have an order in one dimension, but they don't have order in the other dimension. And this type of liquid crystals is called leotropic, leotropic liquid crystals. Now, for today, we have a few more topics out of liquids, or maybe one more of solids still. On Friday, we are going to see the pictures from chapter number five, and you are going to have questions, and if there will be no questions, we start chapter number six, and on the coming Tuesday, there will be quiz for chapter number five. Okay, so 11.30 to 12.
And important thing, for the last two quizzes, I've forgotten to give you extra questions. So this one will have three extra questions. And important thing, I may forget again, remind me, okay? So, otherwise the quiz number six will have four extra questions and that's too much. So, okay, that's the first thing. Second thing, there is a also a date for final. It would be January 11th. This is the Friday. Oh, everybody woke up. And I'm also happy to tell you that for the final exam, I will be making the questions for chapter number five. So that will be difficult. So you can start preparing for the quiz for Tuesday already. Okay. We know that the radius of copper is 128 picometer. What can we also say is 1.28 Ohmstrom. That's interesting. I was doing recently some calculations and I needed this. So we find that in the crystal, I, I don't know what the crystal is, but in the crystal, in the metal, metal, the Cu, Cu is 1.28 Ohmstrom. Now, you don't have to have, this means, what is the chemical formula of this? The chemical formula is, is Cu infinity, infinitely many atoms in a crystal. But what happens if you go to Cu two atoms in a gas phase, just two atoms flowing together? I found the experimental data for this Cu, Cu, and turns out that this is approximately 2.3 Ohmstrom. Huge difference you see that going to metal really stabilizes the bonds. So having only two atoms, it's almost Van der Waals complex, but going to the, to the metal, it goes you down to 1.28 on the strand. Huge difference. So always when I'm teaching you, I'm also learning something myself. I never compared these two data, but now it just came interesting time. Okay, first thing. Next thing, density of copper is equal to 8.93 gram per cubic centimeter. Okay, question. What brother type we have for copper? Is it the, it's probably cubic, this one we can probably assume, but is it cubic P, or is it cubic I, or maybe cubic F? Well, I don't know. Can we calculate? Is it enough data to tell what is the internal structure of the crystal, just knowing these two things? Well, maybe, who knows?
Let us try to do it. We know that the density is mass divided by volume. So let's assume that this is cubic P. If this is cubic P, then our atoms are just on the corners. What do we have there? 1.28 angstrom. And we know that the number of atoms inside is just one. Okay, so we can calculate the density for this structure. The density for this structure would be mass of single atom of copper divided by the volume of this primitive cubic. Okay, what is this? Mass of a single copper atom is the molar mass of copper divided by the number of Avogadro number and this one is nothing else than A to the power 3. The mass of copper is, who knows, must be around 56, 63.55, right? Now, yeah, let's keep this. 63.55 gram per mole divided by Avogadro number? Now is the interesting part. Uh, this is unit of this is one per mole. And this one is what? We want this finally to be in centimeters, so we try to express this one in centimeters. 128 picometers is 1.28 times 10 to minus 12 meter, which is 10 to minus 10, right? 1.20. Yeah. So we have here, it's 1.28 to the power 3 and 10 to minus 30 centimeters cube. Correct? Let me understand this. One angstrom is 10 to minus 10 meters is 10 to minus 10 times 100 centimeters is 10 to minus 8 uh, centimeter. Correct. Thank you. 10, 8, yes, thanks. So we have not 30 here, but we have here, what, uh, 24. Okay, now this is what? Sixty three point fifty five six zero two twenty three and twenty four will cancel giving just ten. 
times 128 to the power 3 gram per centimeter cube, which is Fifty. Five zero. Cannot be. This one divided by this is around ten. Divided by ten is around one. Just cannot be. Fifty? One five or five, five zero? I'm sorry, I have to say no. It cannot be. Calculated once again. time today to finish this. Sorry, you are right. It's not 10, but 10 to minus 1. Okay, so maybe you're right. Maybe it's around 50. But anyway, it's different than what we expected than this one. So this is a way of showing this is not this structure, right? It cannot be this structure. So we have to analyze other, other unit cells cubic F and cubic I and turns out that for cubic F you can do similar calculation and for cubic F you find 8.9 gram per centimeter cube and for the cubic I you find 8.2 gram per centimeter cube. You see that out of these two numbers, this one is much closer to the real density of copper than this. So we can diagnose that probably, most probably, copper has the cubic F closed packing structure. Okay, thank you for today. Next class, we are finishing the chapter number five.